Welcome to The Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Seal, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about lumbar spinal stenosis. I'll be posting new videos frequently, so don't forget to hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. Lumbar spinal stenosis is one of the most common things that I see in the clinic. Before watching this episode, I would encourage you to watch the episode on lumbar spine anatomy, x-ray, and MRI. As a reminder, this is the lumbar spine, which is the low back. There's the belly, there's the back. The yellow things in here are the nerves. Lumbar spinal stenosis is one of the most common things that we see. Lumbar is just low back, which is this area. And stenosis is a very fancy word for narrowing. Even though it's a medical word we use, stenosis is just an adjective. Stenosis means narrowing. For example, a hallway can be stenotic, a highway can be stenotic when there's a lot of traffic. It just means narrowing of the space available for the nerves. Lumbar spinal stenosis is typically from a bone spur in the low back, and those spurs can occur at multiple levels in the low back or only at a single level. The spurs commonly come from what's called the facet joint. This is, this is the facet joint, and when there's arthritis in the facet joint, the bone spurs can grow out, and as the bone spurs grow out, they can push on the nerve. Let's look at some basic imaging on an MRI to look at what lumbar spinal stenosis looks like. Here on the left-hand side is a normal MRI. There's the back, there's the buttock, and there's the belly. This bone is called the sacrum. That's S1, L5, L4. These are the discs, which are the soft cushion between the bones. These are the nerves coming down, these strands of gray swimming in this white stuff, which is spinal fluid. This is a good picture of stenosis, which is, again, back, buttock, and belly. Between the L4 and L5 bone, you can see that there's a little bone spur here that is pinching from the back and it's pinching the nerve against the disc in the front. Sometimes bone spurs can coexist with disc bulges and disc herniations. In this situation, you can see the compressing and kind of the hourglassing of this area which shows a pinch nerve. So this is a pinch nerve at the L4, L5 level. There's two general kinds of stenosis that I see. One is called multi-level stenosis, which is exactly what it sounds like. It means that there's compression of multiple levels, more than one level, up and down the spine. Sometimes it's combined with something called congenital stenosis. The word congenital means you were born with it. Some people were just born with a smaller spinal canal. In that situation, you'll see two, three, four levels of compression. The other flavor of stenosis is called single level compression. And sometimes that single level can either be a compression at one level on one side, which means unilateral, or both sides, which means bilateral. The left-hand side demonstrates a patient with multi-level compression. So L5, L4, L3, L2, these are the nerves coming in. You'll see that every single level has a degree of kind of hourglassing and pinching. So here there's a bone spur, bone spur, bone spur, bone spur. The L4, 5 level is the worst, but there is definitely multi-level compression here. This right-hand image shows that all the levels look pretty normal except for the single level, which is L4-5. This is what compression looks like on an MRI on cross-section. So this is what's called the sagittal, which is the side view. This is the cross-section. So this is patient laying flat like this, looking from bottom up. So there's the disc and there's the space for the nerves. And you'll see if we cut at L4, L5, the nerves are totally compressed in this kind of triangular type shape. And these are the bone spurs here that are pinching the nerve. This just to show you the normal level, this is a cross section of L5, S1. And here you can see how open this is. The nerves look like strands of spaghetti on cross section. These are these little dots here. And here you can see there's no space for the nerve. Making the diagnosis of lumbar spinal stenosis is really a MRI finding. It's not really an x-ray finding. The x-rays typically look pretty normal. As a reminder from the prior episode, almost all patients have lumbar spinal stenosis, meaning if you were to get a random MRI of 100 people over the age of 65, greater than 90% would have some findings of a pinch nerve, which is lumbar spinal stenosis. Not all those patients have symptoms, and obviously we only get involved as physicians when patients start to have symptoms. 
symptoms of compression on a single level is something called radiculopathy. Radiculopathy just means pain in the distribution of the nerve. Typically it's the L4, the L5, or the S1 nerve, which are the nerves at the lower levels in the lumbar spine. The L4 and L5 and S1 nerves are part of the sciatic nerve, so lumbar spinal stenosis at a single level usually causes something called sciatica. A sciatica is simply a term that talks about irritation or compression of the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is in fact a bundle of nerves that are a confluence of the lower lumbar nerves, L4 down to S2, that come down, form a rod-like structure or a cable-like structure that goes all the way down to the buttock and leg. This is the patient's left leg. There's the butt. So the sciatic nerve is here. By then, all the nerves have already come together to become the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve comes all the way down and it goes all the way down to the tip of the foot. Patients that have sciatico or pinching of the sciatic nerve experience pain in different areas and weakness in different areas. And this is because a nerve does two different things. One, it supplies sensation, and two, it supplies motor control, meaning the nerve plugs into a muscle, and if the nerve is compromised, the muscle becomes weak. We're gonna talk about different muscles and what to look out for, but here you'll see that when you pinch the L4, L5, or S1 nerve, which is the lowest three segments, the L4 nerve comes down the front of the leg to the inside of the leg, the L5 nerve, goes around the outside leg to the big toe, and the S1 nerve is primarily back in the buttock, down the back of the leg to the outside of the foot. Several different ways to test the L4, L5, and the S1 nerve, but typically I'll have the patient seated and I'll have them extend their legs slightly with their heel on the floor and say, big toe up as strong as possible and push down on the entire forefoot. I should be able to lean on the entire forefoot and have no ability to push down. Full strength is essentially five out of five strength is full resistance where I can't push down. And she has five out of five strength. That's to test the L4 nerve. The L5 nerve can be tested by just a big toe. Interestingly, the L5 nerve sends supply to the muscle that controls extension to the big toe. So I ask patients to bring their big toe up towards the nose, push down. And if there's good resistance, it means the L5 nerve is strong. The S1 nerve is tough to test. The S1 nerve is the gastroxoleus muscle, which is the calf muscle. And because it's a very strong muscle, I can tell patients to push down like a gas pedal, but it's very difficult to detect weakness. The best way to detect weakness in the gastroxoleus muscle is to have the patient stand, stand on the bad leg like a stork on one leg and come up and down on tippy toes 10 times. It's okay to hold on to something for balance, if you can come up and down on your tippy toes 10 times, that means there's full strength. Interestingly, a heel walk is also a great way to test the L4 and L5 nerves. Remember I said the L4 and L5 nerves is dorsiflexion. Essentially, I tell patients to walk on their heels with their big toe up towards the sky. You can either march in place or take a few steps forward and backwards. If you can walk on your heels and this forefoot doesn't fall down, it means the L4 and L5 nerve are totally strong. When there's congenital stenosis, meaning you were born with a spinal canal or compression at multi-levels and every single level is tight, like the prior MRI I showed you, patients start developing something called neurogenic claudication. Claudication was typically described as something part of blood vessels. When blood cannot get to a certain part of the body and there's narrowing of the blood vessels, we call that vascular claudication. Neurogenic claudication is something similar or a spinoff off of that which is when the signal from the nerve cannot get out of the spine and down the legs, the nerves feel like they're being strangled, and therefore we call that neurogenic claudication. Neurogenic claudication usually presents as leg pain, cramping, numbness, tingling down both legs, sometimes the front, sometimes the back, and the most telltale sign is pain in the legs and aching in the legs when patients are walking. Most patients say, they can walk one or two blocks, but after that they have to sit down. Patients with neurogenic claudication, when they sit down, get relief of the pain. And the reason they do is because when you sit, the spine goes like this. When the spine flexes forward with sitting,
the back of the spine opens up and the space for the nerves open up. So patients with lumbar spinal stenosis love to sit and they hate walking. There's something called a shopping cart sign, which is another telltale sign. And the shopping cart sign means that patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, when they go shopping, they like using a cart, leaning forward on the cart. And again, that's that forward flexion to help open up the spine. Somebody may go shopping with a shopping cart and be able to walk the entire grocery store, but without a shopping cart can only walk two or three aisles. Other symptoms might include numbness in the legs, cramping of the legs. And when lumbar spinal stenosis is significant, patients can get weakness in the legs. And that is because the nerves are not sending signals to the muscles that go down the leg. So patients can have weakness either in the ankle muscles, the calf muscles, or the thigh muscles. No questions if you are feeling symptoms from lumbar spinal stenosis. There's many things we can do about it. And at the next episode, we're going to talk about the non-operative treatments of lumbar spinal stenosis, of which there are many. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. Feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future.